upload that message. We are now being recorded. We will go back into screen share. And I think we are good to go. Right, as is usual, I have absolutely no script for this at all. But what, what got me thinking about this, this is just, you know, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about different ways we can do things. Um, and as you know, I'm, I can get a bit vocal when it comes to teaching people elementary change ringing, because I know there's the usual roots in, but I'm always trying to make things as easy as possible. But the one thing it dawned on me is that every time we teach someone or start teaching someone change ringing, it always includes a, a line that's got dodges in it. And I suddenly thought, actually, there are methods out there that don't have any dodges in and um, might be worth considering as an alternative. I'm not suggesting they would be a route towards um, ringing methods with dodges. It might be that some people just find dodges too hard to, to cope with. You know, not you know, change ringing, it's not something everybody can do. So let's just start moving on a little bit and we'll see what comes up. The usual suspects that get talked about, and I'm sure most of you here are familiar with these. Playing Bob is, is a massive pet hate of mine. I mean, it's okay as a method in its own right, um, but I can never quite understand why it's used to teach elementary change ringing because it's too damn complicated, it really is. Um, Grancer doesn't fare much better, um, added to which the Dodgers are, are, are the wrong way round compared to playing Bob. Um, and also because of the nature of the method, whereas with playing Bob you can at least ring four leads before you have to put a call in. With Grancer, there are every two leads. Um, the calls are quite messy and complicated, they affect everybody generally. Um, so again, I don't think that's an ideal method. We've got methods like the Bisto and Basto, and you, you can see them there on five, which is really a combination of this lot with the plane hunt taken out. Um, but again, you know, there's still this thing struggling with dodges and finding the, finding dodge bells. My own personal favourite, as you think, because I think you know, I couldn't help slipping it in down here. Basto minibus. You can teach everything you need to teach with that, um, in playing hunting and dodging. But again, I've known people struggle with that. But people, you know, I mean, the people who are desperate to get into, into, into change ringing, you know, very keen to see what they can do. So I thought, well, let's let's start with a blank sheet of paper and see what else we could consider. And do, do do ask any you know do interrupt any point if you have any questions to ask. Please don't wait. Please don't wait for the invitation. And I love throwing. Some of you know I love throwing questions out. So do shout the do shout the answers back as quickly as you can. What does that look like to most of you? It's like playing Bob without the dodges. Mm -hmm. Christine. Sorry. What, what did you say it looks like? I said it looks like playing Bob doubles without the dodges. The pattern of it. Simpler. Mm. Basically playing hunting. If you, were to, if you were to take out this bit here, mm. apart from that, it is straightforward playing hunting on four bells. Yeah. Okay. There's another one I dug up which I'm hoping you'll agree also look very much like playing hunting on four bells. Can anybody spot anything else about it? <coughs> it's, a mirror Im <coughs> it's a mirror image of the other one, isn't it? You're, at, you're on fire this morning, Christine. That's what I like. <laughs> exactly. It's, it, it is purely a mirror image of the other. We'll come back to a bit of detail again. <coughs> Penultimus is even more plain hunting than the other two. And what makes Penultimus a little bit different is in fact the treble only hunts up to fourth place. So it is in fact a slightly shorter playing course. But with the exception of two extra blows, 
put in here, that is just plain hunting on five. And then one final one. There's a method here which it's, it's become known as Big Bob, but it isn't it isn't officially a method and it doesn't have an official name. And the simple reason being is because there are repeated changes in the playing course. So I'm not really going to dwell a lot on this on this particular one, but that doesn't mean to say you couldn't have some fun learning it and ringing it. And the, the basic idea of it is that again it's plain hunting on five, but each time the treble goes to the back. The treble makes four blows at the back, not two. So on the one occasion you find yourself running towards the treble at the back, you have to make a place in front of it to come back in again. But apart from that manoeuvre there, that is also playing hunting on five. Okay? Any questions so far? Yeah. I must be doing well. I must be doing well. It's worth probably just mentioning at this point as well, and this this is, is well, I say it's a personal opinion. I know other people like you. I'm a little bit um, anti people just ringing plain hunts. You tend to see bands sometimes grab hold and say, "Well, let's just let's just ring plain hunts on five or six or whatever." Um, and it is inevitable. It is inevitable when bands do that that you end up picking up the numbers. It's not difficult to do. Um, there's a logical process in the numbers and you very very soon find that bands are ringing it and ringing it by numbers. Now that in itself is not a bad thing at all. If it means a band can get together and they can whack out 12 rows of plain hunting on something and strike it reasonably well or keep it working on that, that's absolutely fine. The problem you do have is when you want to try and go forward into method ringing, Having learnt no numbers, which is, is actually not, is it going to be no help whatsoever? It would actually be a, de a detriment because you really need to be able to see the ropes as they come to you, not just remember them off pat. And I would say the same with these sort of methods as well, is that largely while you find some of them will have a, ve a, a very similar number sequence, although you will be passing the treble in a different point as you go through. But it's just worth bearing that mind that, that, that fact in mind. I know it's only a, a small, small change from straightforward play hunting, but that doesn't mean to say oh, it will be a straightforward progression from play hunting. <coughs> you still going to need to be, you know, you need to be aware of the fact that you'll need to start developing rope sites and try to keep an eye out for the bells as they come to you. Okay, that's got that bit out of the way. Here's a few simple rules for ringing Devon Place. And I've tried to make this as simple as possible because that's about all my brain can cope with. Basically, it's plain hunting on four bells. And you can see that here. That's fourth place bell start. And you can see that most of the time he only gets as far as fourth and turns back in again. But at some point, he's going to have to do this bit. Now, if you want to, then you can learn the method and think, I'm going to learn it by play start, I'm going to learn the blue line. There's absolutely no shame in that whatsoever. And if suddenly, you know, somebody said, okay, can you ring the third? You know that you started making force and going back in. No harm in that at all. But you could, you could also ring it by learning, by remembering the basics, that in fact, it is just play hunting on four but knowing when to look out for that point. And here's what you need to do. As you're plain hunting away, you need to look out for when you take the treble from the lead. And you can see that marked there. As you come into lead, you can see that you take the treble off. Now I will say I've occasionally come off. I've, I've occasionally come across people who say yes, but I don't know when I've turned the treble from lead, which I do find a little bit staggering, to say the least. Get used to looking out for the treble. It's quite often your friend. It will. It will be a key. It's a key lookout for, for sort of what comes next. 
So try and be aware in this particular case. <coughs> but I've also got a fallback position as well. If you miss that, look out for when you take the treble from the back, which is the total opposite of what's happened there. So if you come away from the front and think, oh, I think I might have just turned the treble from me there, definitely keep an eye out. And in, in, in ringing speak, this would be a case of the treble being the last bell that you pass. I'm sure you're obviously all aware that as you, as you travel, as you hunt from the front to the back, you pass every bell or every other bell. You have to pass all the bells to pass to get from the front to the back. So if you've passed all the other working bells, whichever ones they are, if the only bell left is the treble, that means having passed them, you are now at the back. So you've now got to this point here. Now the next instruction is quite interesting because notice I stay, stay in fifth place until the treble returns to the back. What haven't I mentioned? Silence again. Anyway, what haven't I mentioned about that bit of work? Uh, how many blows are on? Well done, Margaret. Well done. Assume it's four. Out of interest, can you tell us how many there are? Is it four? Four. Have another go. <laughs> I can see your math, but you've missed out the factor of two. Is it eight? Oh, is it eight? It's eight. Yes. Okay. Because the treble is going to take four blows to get back down to the front and four blows to get back out again. Mm. <coughs> it's eight. But again, I'm trying to keep life simple. I'll tell you what, when I'm ringing a method and there are eight, there are, there's an eight pull dodge in it, you do get them occasionally. Believe you me, I do not count eight dodges. I lose count after about three. So this is a case in point. You don't need to count those eight blows. And here's yeah. the reason why. You quite simply stay in fifth place until the treble comes up to the back again. So you're just basically doing what the tenor would do if you were ringing a tenor behind to a method. You just keep watching all the bells in front and stay in the last place until you find the trebles in front of you. At that point there. And then you just carry on playing hunting again on four. It really, Real. yeah. Um, I don't know if this is taking a, you in a direction you don't want to go, but uh, of course those eight blows at the back, what you can also do is notice that you're ringing, apart from a blow over the treble at the start and the end, um, you're ringing two blows over each of the other working bells as they come up and make forks underneath you. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't going to mention that, but not, not deliberately so, but that, that is a point well made. Um, and I sort of touched on it when I said it's a bit like ringing the tenor behind, yes. because anyone who's done that is usually quite familiar with the fact that a bell will come to the place in front of them, have two blows there and then go away again. And yes, they, they, will, they will see that again exactly when they do those, when they do those eight blows behind. But thank you, thank you for introducing that. Okay, but any, any other questions with that so far? No. Yes. Yes, as, um, as Christine rightly points out, George's Magus is very simply exactly the reverse of what we've just done. And the rules for bringing it are equally simple. It's still basically playing hunting on four. But whereas, of course, with Devon Place, the playing hunting was between first place and fourth place. With this, it's between second place and fifth place. Which might feel a bit odd. I tend to find it's more in the sort of the psyche of when we're ringing. It feels unnatural to go hunting down towards lead, but not actually getting there actually stopping in second place and turning around. So that's something just to be aware of when you're in this. And like with Devon Place also, we just need to be aware of when 
we're going to do this very long lead at the front. And so the instructions are pretty much the reverse of the previous day. Start by looking out for when you take the treble from the back. So the treble's at the back. You've hunted out and the treble is the last bell you meet. So that's your first lookout point. If you miss that, look out for when you take the treble from lead. Those two instructions appeared in Devon Place. They were just the other way around. Look out for when you take the treble from lead and then who's going to tell you what the next instruction is? Lead until the treble comes back. You got it on, you got it in one. And just continue leading until the treble returns to lead. And you can see that spot down there. And believe you me, if you think leading for eight blows is easy, you'd be surprised how automatically people stop after two. Mm. It's in our psyche. They get down to lead, they do a hand stroke and a back stroke lead, and then stop. And they try coming away. Don't. Carry on leading. It will feel really, really strange. But again, it's something worth trying and having a bit of fun doing. Okay, so you continue reading until the treble comes to the lead, and you can probably remember what the, remember what the last instruction is. Anyone want to shout it out? You on four. Four. Okay, so those two very, very, ident very, very identical instructions. Um, and some people prefer Devon Place, some people prefer George's Maggot. But there you go. There's a couple of straightforward methods. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on to penultimus, this is a little bit different, but we can still ring it the same sort of way. Basically, this is playing hunting on five, it's a five bell method, you're ringing on five. Do notice, as I said earlier, the, the, treble, the treble is only playing hunting on four. Okay, so if you've got, it, it might be you've got a You've got someone who can ring the treble on four. They're not very good on five, but they can ring it on four. There you are. Stick, it, stick them on the treble for this. Again, your first lookout point is when the treble turns you from lead. You're sort of becoming familiar with that phrase now. It's, you know, sometimes methods ask you to look out when, for example, you're passing the treble in, in three, four or something like that. That's somewhat harder. But knowing when you pass the treble at the front, or at the back should be very, very straightforward. So that's your first lookout point there. If you miss that, look out when the treble is immediately in front of you in fourth place. Okay, so you come up to the back and just give you a bit more detail on that. You can see it here. So you come to the back you're lying at the back and at that point you're probably about to think well I would normally be coming back in but you notice the treble is sitting right in front of you well the treble is going to want to make fourth so you have no choice you have to stay there so that's your second lookout point okay mm -hmm. there you are. Put that little circle around it that's your second lookout point so when you've got to there, you remain in fifth place for a further two blows. So you've got the first one where the red circle is, and you put another two in, one, two, and then you resume playing on the on five. How easy is that? Any questions on that so far? No. Not so easy. I mean, the rest of you might fall asleep because I can't see you on the screens. <laughs> Assuming you're still there. And then with Big Bob, finally, a few simple rules again. And again, just, just to just remind you what I said earlier, the treble here does not, does not plain hunt. It hunts, it does a repeat of pattern every lead. But if it was to be plain hunting, it would be doing two blows at the back and it's not, it's doing four. And this is sort of a reverse of penultimate. It is basically plain hunting on five, I think you can see that's largely plain hunting on five there and there. The first lookout point, 
Oh yes, I mentioned here that the treble does four blows in fifth place. So your first lookout point again is look out for when you take the treble from lead. You can start seeing the importance of this now. You look out for the treble. When you take the treble from lead. If you miss that, look out for when the treble is immediately behind you in fourth place. And again, I can show that here. You, you should, by virtue of the fact you've turned the treble from lead, you should already be thinking to yourself, right, I need to make fourths when you get here. But your second backup is the fact actually you get to fourth place and the treble is behind you and the treble's going to want to stay behind you. So fourth place is as far as you go. So if you miss that, look out when the treble is immediately behind you in fourth place, then make fourths, as in two blows in fourth place, and then resume pain hunting on five. So those are the basics. Any questions on any of those so far? You know, an observation, Phil, I never would never notice the trebles behind me in fourth place, so I would rely on the um, uh, it's taken me from me. Which, which is which is fine because you know it's it's one of those yeah. things. Yes, it's good if you can get to know who's behind. Because if you if you're if you are hunting out, if you were going to keep going out, you would know the trouble was behind you because you'd be wanting to change places with them. Yeah, I would think of it more more as if I haven't actually passed the treble mm. by yeah. the time I get to. Yeah. That. Yeah, I think this is I a general observation about it being easier to spot who's in front of you than yeah. who's behind you. Yes, that's right. But you can do it by elimination. Well, exact, exactly. As I say, you, you should be savvy enough to know, actually, yes, if I've turned the trouble from lead, I'm going to make false. And that, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Now, interestingly, what I thought I would do, because I'm also a great fan of, you know, you can do an awful lot of ringing without five bells. You don't have to have five bells. There's nothing wrong in ringing on four bows, so I put this lot little lot together. If you're finding doubles too hard, you can always take a bell off. And the other beauty of these methods is that's literally all that you do. If, if you try reducing other methods, it gets complicated, but these are very, very straightforward. Um, and interestingly enough, there's, there's, some, there's some interesting names coming up here. If you take Devon Place and take a bell out of it, so you're going to ring it on four bells, it looks like that, and it's called single chords. But I think you can see the similarity in the line. You still have those extended flows at the back, but instead of hunting up and down on four places, you're now doing it on just three. We used to ring that quite regularly at Sheldon when we had four bells. <laughs> George's maggot, same thing again. That becomes reverse chords. But it's the same basic method. Penultimus becomes Nelson B. And I don't know why actually, because when you take penultimus onto high numbers, they're still called penultimus. I think there's also, yeah, I think it's officially called little, 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 little penultimus or something like that. I yes, penultimus little place. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But when you when you go down to four, it's called Nelson B. And I can't, I just don't know why. <laughs> And then finally, with regard to Big Bob, um, despite it not being an official method, it does reduce down and it produces that line there. And I've called it that line because I'm blown if I can remember the name for it, but I have written it here. Who would like to see the most stupendously ridiculous method name imaginable? Awesome. It's, not George, it's not George's Maggot then? <laughs> it's not George's Maggot, no. This beats that by a long way. How's that? Right. Bill's Maggot. In these one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Lind Simon Lindford's maggot. Yeah. That's what it is officially called. It's also worth reminding people as well, ringing on four bells can be a bit hard work. I advocate always ring it on six bells or at least five bells and have one or two cover bells. 
it makes the bell handling elements and ringing on four bells so much easier. Mm. And once you and, it, and again, you can start developing rope sight this way as well by ringing the tom. So, so, it, so say you decide actually, you know, for rope sight reasons or whatever, or you know, for the strength of band, you want to ring on four bells. Then ring on four bells with two cover bells. But then what you can also do to try and spice things up and, and improve your rope sight is have say bells numbers four and six covering or three and six covering and ring the method on bells one two three five or one two four five and again it varies it varies the music as well and the other thing with this as well is i, I was pointing out all, all the sort of lookout points on the methods they're in exactly the same place when you drop down to minimus as well they are no different they are no different at all So that's something worth trying. You don't have to, you know, you might just go straight in and try the minimus before even trying the doubles. But they are identical. <coughs> you can also go the other way. If you get very proficient at this and think, oh, well, actually, you know, we'd like to be a little bit more complicated what can you do. Well, you can go the same way. Devon plays doubles. Goes to a method called Darling Point. And as you can see, I've already highlighted the lookout points. They are again in exactly the same place. I'm sorry if this talk is sounding very boring and repetitive, but that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. When you've got a couple of these rules, they, they, they are common throughout all the methods. And also George's maggot. That goes to a method called Christmas Eve. <laughs> that's having Christmas one practice night, there you go. <laughs> The Christmas Eve of the practice night as opposed to the practice night of Christmas Eve. I haven't shown the extensions for penultimus because I would like to think that by now you've got the hang of what's going on here. You can work it out for yourself. Okay, it really isn't difficult. And likewise, Big Bob, if you want to extend that. Okay. <clears throat> now there is one other advantage. There is an, another advantage with a couple of these methods. All too often, these type of methods, tend, they tend to get thought of as, as sort of um, trainee methods, and they're not really proper methods, and they're, they're used as a stepping stone to something else. No, they are some of two of them, which I'll come to in a minute, are proper methods. You can call <coughs> and singles with them, and as a result of which, you can ring 120s, you can ring court appeals, you can do anything with them that you can do with any other method. Don't think of them as any lesser method than anything else. They might be very, very plain and simple, but they are still a proper method, and there's actually no shame in ringing them for quarter fields or whatever you want to do with them. Okay. But I thought I may as well cover off what happens at the bottom in singles, even if that may be a little bit beyond what the nature of the talk is. The initial thing is to get people into ringing some of these things. But if you want to have a look at what they do, George's maggot, you can ring touches of this stuff. Devon Place doesn't work, by the way. Um, there, there, isn't, there isn't a satisfactory bolt for Devon Place. It, it, all it does is just shorten the plane, just shorten the plane course and uh, send you down the dead end alley. But George's maggot does, does have bolt and seal. That is what a plane lead end of George's maggot looks like. And you've got the line there showing the backstroke of the treble lead. And can anyone tell me what does it look as though those, those other bells are doing? Dodging. Dodging, yeah. Look. Look again. Oh, I said, sorry. Yes, that's fine. They're, they're plain hunting. Those yeah. bells are just plain hunting. So that's yeah. the end of the lesson. Come down to the lead end, and everyone is just plain hunting. Okay. This is what a bob in George's maggot looks like, and I've only highlighted in blue the bells that are affected. So you can see straight away if a bob is called in George's maggot at the point where you were running in to take the treble from Lee, or you were running out having taken the treble from Lee. Sorry, if you're running out the treble having taken you from the lead, or running in to take the treble from the lead. As you can see from that, 
you are unaffected. It does not affect you at all. Whereas, as as you would at a bob normally in play bob and other methods, a bell makes fourths, and you can see there that is what the third is doing. Mm. It's coming out. It would, if the bob wasn't called, normally run out to fifth place. But all it does is it stops and makes fourths. And in fact, back to the last instruction of all those other sheets we went through, it then just resumes play hunting. And because that bell is making fours there, the bell that's on the back would be lying here as the call is made. It just has to do another two blows on the back. Oddly enough, in exactly the same way you would lie at the back if it was evolving playing by Okay. Okay. That's where the call would be made. The call is made at the backstroke. And the call is actually made, as in the, the bob is made, at that backstroke there. There's a lot of confusion, I find, when it comes to discussing bobs and singles in methods. So many people think it affects three or four rows. It doesn't. It only affects the row, it only affects the change from the hand stroke of the treble lead to the backstroke of the treble lead. That's all that is affected. Nothing above there is affected and nothing below there is affected. It is just that change from there to there. That is all. And that is the same of any other method. Even, even in things like Kent Treble Bob, where people think a call creates three dodges, it doesn't. And in Grancer, where people think a call creates two dodges, it doesn't. It just it just is one step back, and that's all that's happening there. So as well as doing bobs in this stuff. You can do singles as well, which makes it far more entertaining than playing Bob Williams. You can do singles as well. But whereas the Bob affected the bells in fourth and fifth place, the single affects the bells in seconds and thirds. You can see there that the bells at the back are unaffected. Okay? So if you've just been turned from the lead by the treble, you would make seconds and lead again. And like in like a single in playing Bob, if you're coming off the back and you're going to run in, you would make thirds with two blows in thirds, which is easy in a way because you're following the bell making seconds for two blows. And then you just carry it back out again. And in exactly the same way, the position of the call, where the call is made and where the bob itself is made, exactly the same happens with a single. It just affects the change from the hand stroke of the treble lead. The backstroke Any questions regarding the calls there? Okay. Yeah. Now, the other method, um, penultimate, is, is the other method of this group that, for which you can win calls. And I've put them all there in all the detail alongside George's Maggot. Now I'm just going to give you a minute to look at that, or even 30 seconds, and then I want you to tell me what you notice about those. They're exactly the same pattern. Someone didn't hang around there. Thank you, Linda. In fact, not only are they all the same pattern, have you looked at the numbers? Same numbers, yeah. <laughs> I've literally cut and pasted. <laughs> And again, this, this is worth noting because, if, you know, if, 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 if you're ringing, if you're ringing a, a doubles method or a minor method and the bob is called, someone is going to make fourths. And that someone making fourths will affect what else happens. And this is just a classic example. Once you've, once you've nailed the calls to one method, then they're exactly the same. For another method, so you don't have to learn the actual call itself, you don't need to learn anything different. Okay, mm. and I've just I've just realized and the next slide is the last slide, there's a bit of bad editing in it, but never mind, we'll, we'll, I'll show it you anyway. That last line I'm going to drop in later on, just excuse the fact it's there. But here are some other methods you could try. Sippen and place. Um, it's almost a George's magazine that 
it, whereas with George's magnet, you'd be on the lead, on the, on, you'd be leading for the whole lead end. Here, you only do it for half of it. And there's a slight variation in there because of this bell neck echoes. You get thirds made at the lead end there. But again, you can look out some of the um, observation points. These are things you can do. These are things you can do yourself. Um, look out for the observation points, and that will tell you what you should be doing next. Oak place, where again you have bells leading for half the lead on the front, but you have a long fifths on the back, like you would in plain bob. And there's a bell making fourth as well. So technically, that lead end is like a bob in uh, in George's magnet. Yeah, well, if I could just um, interrupt briefly, um, yes, sure. I, I, I can't help noticing on Sippenham Place that uh, you are successively plane hunting uh, on five and then on four and then on three. Yeah. Which is an interesting experience. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, again, if, if someone wants to learn it that way, they yeah, I shall learn the line for it. There's nothing, there's no harm in that at all. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's something a bit different. Wellington Place is one of these funny places. That one, that those that fifth, fourth, fifth at the back isn't too difficult because in actual fact it's around the treble. You're lying at the back, the trebles come out, so you make fourths in front and back out again. This seconds, thirds, seconds is a little bit harder. Something you just have to remember and work out. And that as it sounds, Despite the fact I hate plain bob doubles, I thought I would include reverse Canterbury because some of you might recognise that as bob doubles without the dodges. Those places there are purely a substitute for 3-4 up and a 3-4 down dodge. But I, I cannot stress enough, do not think, oh in that case I'm going to use this as a route to bob doubles. Don't make bob doubles the holy grail. Okay, there are plenty of other things you can try, and you can bypass bob doubles. I've, I've taught people to ring, and they've, they've never gone near bob doubles. They just bypassed it. You know, don't don't, don't keep making a beeline towards it. I put that there just to show actually there can be connections between some of these methods with places and methods with dodges. Okay, but don't don't think of it as a as a different route to bob doubles. The, the, the road to bob doubles is, is fraught enough and complicated enough as it is without making any harder. I, I believe in making things as simple as possible, simply because I put my brain in coping. And then yes, just referring to that bottom line, all these methods can be reversed. So if you want a little bit of homework to do, you can find out what Sippenham place is on Bismet or Blue Line or whichever whichever port you use. Um, you can look at the place notation, see if you can reverse that, and then write out the blue line for it. I, I, I think Sippenham's called Hordle. I did have a quick look at it the other day just to try and find it. I think it's Hordle. But the other thing I'm trying, the other thing I'm trying to do in, in my new role is to encourage people to start working things out as opposed to just, what's it called? Getting the handheld device out and looking at the blue line. It's, it's not the best route to learning. Sometimes you're better off getting a pencil and a paper, getting the place notation and writing it out. It will, it will, it will sink in. So on that note, I'm going to shut up and you're probably thinking, thank heaven. Any questions while I've got this on the screen? Well, okay. Well, I'm going to... Uh can I just say, when, when we've run reverse Canterbury, the bobs and singles are, uh, are slightly different from plain bob. Uh, what, what happens with the other three, is it? With these, I have no idea. Okay. I, get, I, had, I, had to, I had to get to a point where, you know, I'm going to shut up. But again, picking up on the reason being, because I want people to go away with it. I want to find out about this, this and this. And you've just asked about the bobs here for these methods. Well, that's something you can go off and find out. And I, and I hope you will. Thank okay. you. Let me just stop the sharing. I'm also now going to stop.